I'm going to show you how to make REST API calls. Let's get started. Hi everyone, I'm Brian Watchers from Bavork. If this is your first time here and you want to learn about automating, programming, and monitoring in VMware environments, you're in the right place. Start now by subscribing and click the bell so that you don't miss a thing. This video is part one in a 10 part video series in which we're exploring how to make REST API calls. In this video, we're going to take a look at the fundamental concepts that you need to understand in order to make REST API calls. As you can see, we're going to be tackling a lot of topics. In videos one through eight, we're going to be taking a generic look at how to make REST API calls. And then in videos nine and onwards, we'll take a look at how to make REST API calls to various VMware products. Now, whether you want to know about REST APIs in general, or you came here specifically because you want to know how to use the REST APIs in VMware products, in either case, you're in the right place. Just make certain that you check out the playlist up above because this is just the first in numerous videos. So check out that playlist. And while you're at it, subscribe and click the notification bell so that you know as each of these videos is released out into the world. When you first start learning about REST, it's really easy to go down a rabbit hole and get caught up trying to define what we mean by REST. So we're going to start off simple. REST stands for Representational State Transfer. That's easy enough. But what does that mean? Well, part of what that means is REST is a software architectural style that's used in client-server communication. Now, out of all the words here on this slide, what I want you to see are these words here, client-server, because in order to understand REST, that's where we need to start. So what do we mean by the client-server model? Well, in the client-server model, there are clients and there are servers. Servers provide access to various services and resources. Clients, on the other hand, connect to those servers across the network in order to access those services and resources. Now, we've defined what client-server model means, but let's take a look at a real-world example that I'm sure you've encountered. Everyone has used a web browser to communicate with one or more web servers. When you do web browsing, the web browser itself is a client and the web server is a server. So we have web clients such as Google Chrome, Firefox, Safari, and uh, additionally on the server side, we have various web servers such as the Apache web server, the Nginx web server, but they all work in this client server arrangement. So if you sit down, for example, in front of Google Chrome and you start web surfing, what's gonna happen is you request to go to a web page and the request is going to be sent across the network using a, a predefined protocol such as HTTP or HTTPS. And that request, again, is going to go from the client to the server. In return, the server is going to process whatever request was made and the server is going to send back a response. So nice and simple. The client sends a request, the server sends a response. But let's take a look a little bit deeper and see what's going on behind the scenes. When you use your web browser to request a web page, the request looks something like this. The request is going to specify what's known as an HTTP method. One of the HTTP methods available to us is the get method. There are other methods such as the post method, the put method, the delete method, and others. Let's go take a look at a document that will help us to understand what we mean by these HTTP methods. As you can see, I fired up Google Chrome and what I'm going to do is search for a document by searching for RFC 2616. RFC 2616 is documented in various places, but let's go here and take a look at it. And as you can see, this is a rather old document. Uh, there are actually subsequent versions of this, but we're going to start with RFC 2616 because it's a good place to start. 
Now, as you take a look at this document, you'll notice that it's defining what's known as HTTP, the Hypertext Transfer Protocol, specifically version 1.1. And if we go scrolling through this document, you can see that there's a table of contents. And what I want to do is take us straight to section number nine, where this RFC defines HTTP methods, such as the get method, the post method, the put method, the delete method. And as you can see, there are others, but those are the four that you need to know to get started with. The get method allows a web browser to request a page from a web server. On the other hand, we have other methods such as the post method, which if you are using a web browser gets used when you do things such as upload a document or a form to a web server. So the get method is in general used to get access to a resource that the server is already managing. The post method is typically used when we want a new resource created on the web server. The put method is used to update an existing resource on a web server. And the delete method, as I'm sure you've already guessed, is used to indicate that you want to delete a resource on a web server. Now, if you want to, you can actually take a closer look at all these by going to section nine. Again, there are some additional methods, but those four, get, post, put, and delete are the ones that we need to know for right now. So in our web browser example, when we request a web page, we're using git as the HTTP method because the web page that we want already exists on the web server. We just want to get it. In order to get it, we have to specify a URL that indicates where on the web server the file resides. And in the HTTP protocol, you end the message by saying which version of the HTTP protocol you're using. Uh, let's not worry about this protocol version back here. Let's just notice that it says get and a URL. So that's what the request looks like behind the scenes. That request gets sent from the web client to the web server and the web server responds by sending a response. And as you can see here in this case, the response from the web server in this particular case is an HTML formatted web page. But you didn't come here to learn about web browsers and web servers. You want to know about REST servers and REST clients. There are loads and loads of different REST servers out there in the world. For right now, we're just going to start out with a REST server example for a product from VMware called ARIA Automation Orchestrator, or perhaps you know it by the older name, which is vRealize Orchestrator. But whatever you want to call it, let's just call it Orchestrator. In the world of Orchestrator, there is a server component and a client component. So I, as the user of Orchestrator, am going to log into the Orchestrator client. And in the Orchestrator client, I'm going to say, let's do something. For example, perhaps I want to create an Orchestrator workflow. That's just a fancy program for automating various IT tasks. So in the Orchestrator client, if I say, let's create a workflow, or let's look up a workflow, what's going to happen is the Orchestrator client, which is just a REST client, is going to send a message across the network using HTTPS to the orchestrator server. So again, just like with the web browser, the orchestrator client is sending a request. And as I'm sure you've already guessed, the orchestrator server is going to respond by sending back a response. But again, let's dig down a little deeper. In the orchestrator client, when you send that request, it's going to, once again, look similar to what we saw with the web browser. We're going to specify a HTTP method and a URL. Um, let's pick this apart and see more closely what's going on here. So the first part, as you already know, is the HTTP method. So if I want to look up an orchestrator workflow, um, that's a resource that already exists on the orchestrator server. Therefore, I want to get the existing resource. On the other hand, if I wanted to create an orchestrator workflow, I would use the post method. So here we're using the get method to look up information about not just one workflow, um, as we can see here, we're going to look up all the orchestrator workflows on that orchestrator server, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of workflows. So to do that, we'll say get, then we'll indicate a URL that says what we're trying to get. In the URL, we're going to specify where the orchestrator server is. As you can see here, my orchestrator server is called vro.vclass.local. 
Um, that happens to be an FQDN, but we could just as easily have used an IP address. So however you want to indicate where the server is, that's what you're specifying at the beginning of the URL. And then you can specify what port number the REST server is listening on. In this case, the orchestrator server is listening to port 443. Then you have something called the base URL. We're going to talk more about that in later videos, but the basic idea behind the base URL is all the URLs I'm ever going to send to the orchestrator server are always going to start out the same way. But at the tail end of the URLs, we're going to specify what operation, what REST operation we want performed. This particular URL says that the operation we want to perform is to look up all of the orchestrator workflows on that orchestrator server. So again, this is what's going on with this specific example. Again, we've got our orchestrator client and an orchestrator server, but this same methodology would be used if you're using a different REST server with a different REST client. So it looks like this behind the scenes when we have the client send the request. Now it's a little twist here, well, and we're going to talk about this more in upcoming videos, but in addition to the HTTP method and the URL, when we send the request, there's potentially going to be other things that get sent, including something called headers, which we'll be talking about, and the body. But for right now, let's not worry about those details. Instead, let's take a look at what happens when the server receives this request. When the server receives the request, the server is going to process the request and it's going to send back a response. Uh, in this particular case here, the response is being returned in what's known as the response body. Now, if you're listening real closely here, you'll notice that there's both a request body and a response body. We'll talk about the difference between those in a bit, but here we're looking at the response body. And in this response body, which happens to be formatted using JSON in this case, but uh, response bodies can come in other formats such as XML. But this orchestrator server is returning a response body in JSON format to provide us information about the names of all of our orchestrator workflows. Now, again, there are hundreds and hundreds of those. I can't fit them all on the screen. Uh, you'll get to see all of them in some upcoming videos, but this is just a brief glimpse at what the response body might look like. It might say for each of the workflows, the name of this workflow is Power on VM, and its workflow ID is uh, Delta 8080, blah, 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 blah. So the server sends back a response, and the, the bulk of the information that you're going to receive is going to be in the response body. But there's a little bit more to it than just that. When the server sends back the response, just like the client, we might see that the server sends what are called headers. We'll talk about those later. The server will send back a body. That's what we were just looking at. Again, that's the response body, which is different from the request body. And the REST server is going to return something very very, very important called the status code. Now, in order to understand what we mean by the status code, let's go take a look at RFC 2616 once again. Let's go back to that same RFC and take a look at section 10. Section 10 defines standard status codes. Now, as you can see, there are a bunch of different status codes, but let me jump you straight to one that I know we all have encountered before. Have you ever been in a web browser and attempted to go to web page, but you got a 404 error message? Um, your web browser probably said something like file not found. Well, that's what 404 means. It's a status code defined by the HTTP RFC to indicate that the resource that the client was trying to get in uh, typically a web page, doesn't exist. Take a look at some of these other status codes. Uh, another status code that I bet we've all seen before is a 503. Have you ever gone to a web page, uh, or maybe it was a web app, and you got a message that said 503, service temporarily unavailable? Well, that's the standard code that's used to indicate when um, the the web server, or whatever the server may be, is temporarily unavailable. Now, the interesting thing I want you to see here is that 
these codes come in different ranges. For example, the first code that we saw, 400 and 4, is in the 400 range of codes, or abbreviated here 4XX. Uh, 503 is in the 500 series of codes. Now, there's a pattern to these ranges. Anytime you get back a status code that's in the 400 range, what that means is you're being told that the client has done something wrong. On the other hand, if you get back a 500 series code, that means that the something's going wrong on the server side. Now, as you can see, if we scroll backwards here, there's also a 300 series, a 100 series, but the only other uh, series codes that we need to know right now are the 200 series. Uh, for example, 200 itself is used to indicate OK. All of the 200 series codes indicate that whatever the request was, the, the web server or the REST server was able to successfully carry out that request. So as we move forward in this video series, as we start making REST API calls, whenever we get back a response, the very first thing we are going to check every single time is what status code that we got back. Because if we get back a status code in the 200 range, that means that the response body uh, contains the information that we requested. On the other hand, if we get back a status code of 400 or a status code in the 500 range, that means, well, we better not just go look at the response body and assume it has what we think it was supposed to have. When you get back a 400 series or 500 series, the response body is going to most likely uh, contain some sort of diagnostic information to let you know what's going on. So every time you do a REST request and you get back a REST response, the very first thing you do is you check what status code did you receive. File that away in the back of your brain. I promise I'll remind you of that later on, but it's super important to get in the habit of looking up the status code. All right, now we've mastered some fundamental concepts that we need to know in order to understand everything else that we're going to be talking about in the upcoming videos. Speaking of the upcoming videos, remember this is just part one out of 10 videos. Check out the YouTube playlist to find the next video. Join me in the next video while we continue exploring how to make REST API calls.